Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Maria Liu. Dr. Liu is going to be speaking with us about how they do myopia management in China. Dr. Liu is an associate professor of clinical optometry at UC Berkeley. Her emphasis is on research and clinical expertise, and it's in investigating and utilizing of novel contact lens designs and pharmaceuticals in myopia control. She's the founder and the chief of the Myopia Control Clinic, the first of its kind in a teaching clinic, and, she, and it now serves as a model for other optometry schools across the country. Dr. Liu is originally from Beijing, where she practiced as an ophthalmologist in China before relocating to the United States. She obtained her MBA prior to her optometry degree at Pacific University, and she completed a master's of public health and a PhD at UC Berkeley. What I love about Dr. Liu is that she joins this clinical perspective uh, from the research that she has uh, gained in, uh, in, in her work. And I'm very excited to share this episode with you on the Myopia Podcast. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. We're joined by Dr. Maria Liu, as you can see here. If you're watching and if you're listening, you'll, you know, you'll know her voice. She's been an incredible component and advocate in the myopia space. We're, uh, we're honored to be joined by her. One unique thing, uh, well, many unique things about Maria, but a unique thing in this conversation is that Maria is an ophthalmologist trained in China. And so she has this very unique perspective of myopia management internationally, how we do it here in the United States. And I've had conversations with her about myopia management in China. So I'm excited to speak with you. Thank you for joining us for this episode, uh, Maria. Thanks for having me again. Hi, yeah. David. Uh -huh. uh, well, so, so walk us through a little bit of your journey to the United States and uh, how this, you know, deciding to become an ophthalmologist, first of all, in China kind of came about for you. So um, I was trained um, in China. I went to medical school and did my residency in cornea refractive surgery in China, um, during which I got to see a lot of um, highly myopic patients, but also um, I fit a lot of ortho K lenses. So in my time of fitting a lot of ortho K lenses, which well, I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit um, mm -hmm. later, I, on average, I fit about 30 to 50 patients a day. Um, like in summertime. So you can see the pace of feeding worth okay in China is very different. So anyway, so with my uh, tons of the experience of feeding worth okay patients and also seeing them being washed out um, after many years of wearing worth okay lenses, I have noticed that their uh, change of refraction is not nearly as close to those patients who have been wearing single vision glasses and they're all coming for refractive surgery. So I noticed this distinct difference and that actually triggered my um, curiosity in understanding if uh, worth okay indeed uh, helped slowing down myopia progression and if so, what's the underlying mechanism? So that was my main purpose of doing the PhD work. And, and what year uh, were you trained and, and what years were you doing all of these orthokeratology fits? So my residency was from 1996 to 2000. And so um, I was feeding ortho-K lenses for about three years. Um, so the last three years of my residency mm -hmm. and right before so to, China shut down ortho-K practice. Yeah. So, yeah. so so to give us some perspective on the timeline here, Pauline's study uh, in Hong Kong came out about orthokeratology slowing the progression, and that was something you were you were seeing happening. And so it was kind of like, yeah, this is th there's something to this. We hadn't had a lot of research coming out to kind of solidify this, but you had already started to see this in in practice. Absolutely. Yeah. So I was very intrigued in seeing. How come those patients started off with uh, the same level of myopia around the same age and wore the lenses for several years? Now they're ready for refractive surgery. We wash them out. 
Some of them progressed a little bit. Some of them actually had a lower prescription than yeah. before they were started with Worth yeah. OK. So we were thinking they were not washed out completely. We kept just keeping them like in this monitoring schedule, seeing them every three to six months, and they never recover back to their baseline refraction. Yeah. So you, you alluded to the shutdown. So mm -hmm. talk to us about the shutdown of orthokeratology in China. When was that and what, was, what happened? So um, OrthoK um, became very, very popular in China, and uh, there were a lot of potential problems. Number one, due to the huge demand of OrthoK feeding, not all of the practitioners are properly trained in feeding OrthoK lenses. Number two, there are a lot of, I would say, copycats of a certain OrthoK designs. So the, um, both the design and also the quality of uh, production may not be optimal for um, the long-term wear of the lenses. And number three, patients were not properly educated on how to wear the lenses safely. And in China, there was no, there's still no routine eye care. So um, ophthalmologists are only seeing patients with severe side effects. It's, it's also the case for soft lenses. You don't get to see those uneventful risks. And uh, the ones you are seeing are either like a corneal abrasion or a corneal ulcer. That's now why, are, um, go ahead. And now are soft lenses super prevalent in China? I mean, there's, there's millions and millions of people. Are soft lenses all over the place? Is that something where parents are like, I want soft lenses rather than orthokeratology? So unfortunately, because of the damage um, done in China in the um, early 90s, uh, that we tend to see a very significant amount of uh, MKs related to soft contact lens wear that pretty much damage the reputation of soft lenses among consumers, among ophthalmologists. So still up to this stage, soft lenses equals corneal ulcer in many, many yeah. um, eye doctors' mind. So this was this concern about contact lenses, orthokeratology. So there was this shutdown. Now take us through what's happened since then, because you know orthokes are are being fit now. So what what's yeah. happened, and and who can fit orthokeratology in China? So after that, um, the Minister of Health and the, um, the China FDA has imposed a lot of regulations on how um, ortho-K lens should be fitted. So only ophthalmologists can fit ortho-K lenses in China, technically, although I can tell you how people get around by feeding 100 patients a day. Mm -hmm. And uh, also it requires you know, a certain level of facility only the clinic that qualifies to a certain level that you have to have all sorts of the, instru um, the instruments that you're, if for a licensed doctor certified in ortho -K feeding can fit lenses in those facilities. Mm -hmm. So there's, uh, there are both requirements for the doctors and also on the facility. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's, it's regained popularity and there was uh, the shutdown and then the Minister of Health and, and, and others kind of came back and said, okay, so if we're going to be doing orthokeratology, these are the requirements, as you just stated. Yeah. Um, prior to that, was it kind of just anybody was fitting them? Uh, you know, were opticians fitting them? Or did you have to be a healthcare provider of some sort? Or what was, the, what, what was happening before? Um, so the lenses could be fitted in the hospitals, in the optical shops, and you can even purchase the lenses from the Chinese version of eBay. Mm. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so that's probably a good or thing. Or with lenses. Yeah, that, yes. that it got shut down. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So now we have um, these facilities that are, are allowed, you know, Across China, approximately how many facilities would you estimate there are that are allowed to fit orthokeratology? Oh, I don't have that number in mind. I know there are a lot, but they are still much, much lower than the actual demand. Uh huh. So, so, so they are what I'm alluding to is it, yeah. is it just kind of you know major hospitals, or is it something where? You know, you could look up on the internet and find, 
you know, 150 places in your city or is it uh, pretty, pretty selective? I would say about 30 to 40 percent of the lenses are fit in the hospitals. And there are what we call the level two um, eye clinics. So if you satisfy qualifies as a level two clinic, which you have to have ER, you have to have OR, you need to have all of these instruments. And if specifically to worth okay, you need to have auto refractor, topographer, tonometer, and a corneal endoscopy. And so all of that, that you can fit worth okay lenses. So mm-hmm. um, in short, uh, it's in hospitals or eye clinics. Yeah. So it's not going to be something where uh, just a general eye care provider is 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 having, and there's 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 not optometry in China, if I'm correct. Optometry in China is is not very well um, defined. There are two and three year programs that offers a associate associate degree. There are four year programs that offers a bachelor in optometry mm-hmm. that does not have the license to practice medicine. You also have the five-year program that offers the qualification to take the board's exam to become ophthalmologist slash optometrist, but you also have the seven-year program that offers you a degree in MD slash OD. So you can see there are all sorts of uh, um, ECPs in China. Mm -hmm. So where along that spectrum are people allowed to fit orthokeratology lens, assuming they're in a facility that is allowed to fit the lens. So currently it's still the ophthalmologists, the MDs in those. And that would be um, the seven year degree. Yeah. Yes. So the most advanced yeah. eye training that you can get in China, that's the only people that are allowed to yeah. fit. So you alluded to that there's ways that people kind of get around this and that in these centers are, you know, they may be fitting you know, you were fitting 30 or 50 a day, and it sounds like you were involved in each of those cases. But then in other centers, there may be people that are, you know, less involved in the in the fitting of the lenses. Walk us through um, a typical, right? So there may be centers that are doing hundreds of fits a day. That may be not typical, but walk us through a typical clinical setting um, that a, a patient may come into. How do they find that setting? How do they get an appointment? How do they, you know, how are they treated? How long are they there? Walk us through what it would might look like compared to what it would be here in the United States. So certainly there are um, hospitals that are very reputatious in um, all sorts of eye conditions. And uh, they are also obviously very famous for their ortho practice. And that tends to grow at an exponential um, scale, both Mm -hmm. from the influence of those doctors and also the referral from the patients. And so for those hospitals, uh, patients are booked out probably two, three months out. So if you want to get fitted um, and you make an appointment, like in in July, you can't get fitted until uh, just September or October. Mm -hmm. So for those hospitals, um, the doctors, in order to actually fit as that many patients, they actually have a lot of technicians and opticians. So everything else is done by the technicians and the doctors are just sitting behind the slit lamp and evaluating the fitting and also evaluating the um, anterior segment health. Those are probably the only two things the doctors are doing those who actually sign off the um, prescription for the worth of lenses. Mm-hmm. So I walk into the clinic and what am I going to go through? What's the, what's the process going to be before I walk out the door with lenses? So certainly um, most of the patients, um, their initial contact or initial encounter with worth okay or any anti-myopia treatment started with their refraction. And as I mentioned before, there is no routine eye care in China. There is no insurance coverage for such service. So most of the patients coming to get refraction are due to their failure of school screening. Mm. Or Mm -hmm. something that parents notice, they started squinting, turning um, the head and uh, some obvious symptoms. So once 
they have been identified of having myopic refractive error, then the patients are referred to those eye doctors and then the um, uh, myopia control consultation. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in China, there is no other alternative. There have started to have some novel spectacle designs, but there is um, no low dose atropine, and uh, there is no currently still no uh, multifocal soft lenses for the purpose of myopia control. So any kind of a myopia control consultation naturally leads into ortho K. Mm -hmm. Now, is it pretty pretty well understood that uh, all across China? that you can slow this down with orthokeratology, or is that still a, you know, something that's a public health concern where they, they still need to get the word out? Is it, is it well understood that you can slow down the progression of myopia? Uh, I would say yes and no. For big cities, uh, major cities, uh, most parents understand myopia is a disease. Myopia can cause um, irreversible vision loss and myopia can be controlled. But in some areas, uh, it still takes some education, letting them know that myopia is not a reversible condition. And the purpose of ortho K is to temporarily correct myopia. It's not to cure myopia. Mm -hmm. So I think there are areas where patients and parents are still pretty vague about why they're using ortho K lenses. I think their immediate motivation is still to get rid of glasses. If there's anything I can do to get clear vision without having to wear um, anything during the day, I will go for it. If you have a nice side effects of slowing down the progression, that's even better. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think that's the way that we think about contact lenses in the United States is to get rid of glasses. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to change that perspective is that, we're going to slow down the progression and the side effect is the vision improvement. Mm -hmm. And I think we're continuing to do that, but it sounds like in China, the stigma of having glasses is still the biggest component, not necessarily the slowing of the myopia. I would say that's still the case for a, a very substantial percentage. Mm -hmm. Now I've spoken to people and they just believe that everybody in China is getting orthokeratology, that it is a high percentage of <laughs> children are getting this. Is it, is it done on all children that are myopic? You know, what percentage of myopic children, you know, approximately are wearing orthokeratology? I would say probably less than 1%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as a percentage of the population, orthokeratology or myopia management isn't that much better than the United States. Would that be accurate to say? That's accurate. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, is um, it so the total number of patients are certainly much higher, sure. but because the, the denominator is so big and there are limited numbers of ophthalmologists who can prescribe ortho K lenses. So, the bottleneck there are two bottlenecks. Number one is the financial burden or financial constraints, the second is the number of practitioners um, who are able to prescribe or fit ortho K lenses. Yeah. But that doesn't make sense. And I'm, I'm speaking tongue in, mm -hmm. tongue in cheek here, the financial concerns, because uh, don't they just get it for free? Is that, isn't that what uh, universal healthcare and all that stuff, do they have to pay for it? No. So um, all of these are not considered medically necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned, the, even your eye exam is not, um, it's totally like out of pocket. Yeah. It's not covered by the insurance. So all of the 100% of the worth okay um, cost is out of pocket. Yeah, I'm sure that there's variability to the costs across the across the country. But what what would that equiv uh, approximate equivalent amount of money be for a family to put their child in ortho K lenses uh, a year each year? What would it maybe cost them if it was U.S. dollars? It's very similar to how much we charge for ortho K service. Mm. And so usually um, you can't really separate the charges for the service versus the material in China because mm. people are much less willing to pay for service than to pay something that they can touch or tangible that you know they can have. So unfortunately, ortho K lenses are bundled together 
without telling patients how much of that you're paying for the lenses, how much you're actually paying for the chair time, for the clinical expertise, et cetera. So a lot of patients are thinking they're paying uh, like $1,200 for two pieces of plastics. Uh -huh. And that's unfortunately is the case. So for example, if you accidentally break one or lose one lens, you'll pay half of the package to replace that lens. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that, that would be a, an approximate cost for the whole for the whole year for the person, and that would include the the service as well as the products is probably so at a thousand cost, to two thousand cost. Yeah, yeah. So the average cost for um, ortho K lenses, and this is another thing, people are uh, much more willing to pay for lenses that are being imported from U.S. So uh, my understandings are like a Euclid and CRT lenses are being charged more than domestically made ortho mm. lenses. And on average, uh, people pay somewhere between $1,200 to about uh, $2,000 a year for ortho -K. All ortho mm -hmm. included service and material, not including solutions. Yeah. So that's pretty typical of the United States. I think, I think a couple of the things that you um, have helped us understand is some common myths that maybe some of us have about mm -hmm. myopia management in, in China. And that's that everybody's doing it. And that's that, um, you know, it's very accessible. It's not, it's pretty hard to get in. And uh, that, you know, everybody understands the slowing of myopia, which they don't. They're probably still doing it for refractive correction. And that it's available to so many people because of how inexpensive it is. And, uh, you know, equivalently, it's about the same as it is here. So um, it's, what it's other... actually, um, can I just add one more thing? Yeah, please. It's actually more expensive than um, the average cost of worth okay in U.S., because their package deal is the same price every year, no matter whether this is the new fitting or this is a maintenance service. Versus mm -hmm. in US, my understanding is that most practitioners charge more for the initial fitting year. But mm -hmm. for the following years, if there is no involvement of a major parameter adjustment, the service fee is much lower. This is mm -hmm. not the case in China. So they ended up paying more every year in the in both in terms of their relative income but also in the absolute amount yeah do you think that that drives people to go in for lenses less often oh absolutely i've had patients not replacing lenses for seven eight years multiple patients from china wearing the lenses they got seven years ago wow incredible <laughs> Well, this has been some really insightful information. I appreciate you giving us a perspective outside of our borders and uh, telling us about uh, some common myths that we have. Uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for joining me today. My pleasure as well. Yes. Thank and, you. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time. We would like to thank Euclid for providing their educational support to make this podcast possible. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.